For 10 years, Western intelligence has fought a secret war against Al-Qaeda, the most deadly and sophisticated terrorist organization the world has ever faced. We will not stop this fight. We are at war. war. In the decade since 9-11, the West has employed unprecedented and controversial methods. Drone attacks, secret prisons, and torture. People were desperate. The White House wanted results, and the CIA was told to get them any way you could get them. What's the value of human life, and what is it worth to get information that will save a human life? I've reported on terrorist conflicts for almost 40 years, and never has the West felt more threatened, never has the West hit back with such force. In this series, we investigate whether the secret war has made us all safer. We responded in a way that threw away our values. Hypocrisy breeds hatred, and I'm afraid it has bred hatred around the world. We talk to intelligence chiefs who normally stay in the shadows. In her first ever television interview, the former head of MI5 reveals the scale of the threat. At no stage in these years did we face one plot. All the time we had, you know, up to a dozen other ones we were worried about, or more. And the former head of the CIA maintains extraordinary measures were justified. We were at war, and the nation was still under threat. I do not judge those who had to face far more difficult decisions than I had to make. But how much did British intelligence know about the mistreatment of prisoners abroad? Maybe they wanted us to carry on whatever we were doing. <laughs> it was a tacit approval of whatever we were doing. Ten years after 9-11, what is the nature of the threat that all of us still face? I'd be very surprised if there weren't ambitions to do something on the same scale. There are still hundreds of them out there who are plotting to come after us. And until they're gone, we'll face a threat. I felt the impact. The ceiling was collapsing and then there was a smell of jet fuel. I didn't know if I was going to die. Diane de Fontes was at her desk on the 89th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The first plane hit just four floors above her. Diane just managed to escape but nearly 3,000 people died in America that day. Something like that may happen again. There are others out there meaning to do us harm. Are we safe? I don't think so. 9-11 marked the beginning of President Bush's so-called war on terror. The people who knocked these buildings down after September 11th, the national consensus here is that we are indeed a nation at war. The next day, MI5's Eliza Manning and Buller flew to Washington. We flew over New York and there were no other planes in the sky. I remember thinking about the human tragedy beneath the clouds. But by that stage, I was focused on how my service needed to react, the responsibilities of what we needed to do. Like MI5, America's intelligence agencies had been taken completely by surprise at the sheer scale and ambition of the attack. We didn't see this one coming. We didn't have good intelligence that it was going to happen. We were very worried that there was a possible second operation. So everyone's concern was, um, understand what the threat is out there, understand who may be involved, go find them, stop them, and make sure it doesn't happen. Ground Zero is the biggest crime scene in American history. 
But the immediate priority was not to try and bring the terrorists to justice, but to do whatever it took to wipe out the enemy. 9-11 ushered in a secret war against Al-Qaeda that was to test the West's commitment to human rights to the limit. The sense was, this is an intelligence war. Identify the target and eliminate them so more people don't die. We will take everything we have, every tool we have, and eliminate the prospect that they can kill more innocents. This secret war has been fought in the shadows, in sharp contrast to America's dramatic military response. In Afghanistan, the Americans destroyed the terrorist training camps and toppled the Taliban regime that had protected Osama bin Laden. Although bin Laden escaped, they captured hundreds of prisoners with possible knowledge of Al-Qaeda's members, structure and plans. But there was a problem. America's intelligence agencies were totally unprepared. They had only a handful of Arabic speakers to interrogate the prisoners. If you're thinking about a global war on terror, then you start thinking you want lots of interrogators. The CIA had, as far as I can tell, they had zero experience in interrogating and zero experience in interrogating terrorists in particular. Just three months after 9-11, there was a disturbing reminder of just how immediate the threat was. High explosive packed in a shoe almost destroyed a transatlantic plane. Miraculously, it failed to detonate. The bomber, Richard Reed, was a British Muslim convert who trained at an Al-Qaeda camp. Once again, as on 9-11, the intelligence agencies were taken unawares. That attack said to us, here is a Brit. Here is a Brit who is prepared to support this Al-Qaeda agenda. A Brit who has been to a radical mosque, who has been to Afghanistan. Then we began to be anxious about people who travelled, people who'd been to the camps. The hunt for Osama bin Laden and his high command became more urgent than ever. Six months after 9-11, America made its first dramatic breakthrough in its secret war. In Pakistan, the man thought to be one of bin Laden's top lieutenants was captured. His name was Abu Zubaydah. He was uh, spending a lot of time plotting and planning murder. He's not plotting and he's not planning anymore. The interrogation of Abu Zubaydah would raise an uncomfortable question. How far should the American government go to get intelligence to save lives? Looking at potentially is taking the head off the snake. And it was great. We have one of the major planners is now off the street. A treasure trove of documents was recovered from his safe house. They confirmed that Abu Zubaydah was the gatekeeper for Al-Qaeda's training camps in Afghanistan. He knew the names of just about every jihadi who'd trained there. He unquestionably had access to top Al-Qaeda officials uh, and was very involved in some of their operational planning and training. The CIA put Abu Zubaydah on a secret flight to a clandestine prison or so-called black site. We believe it was in Thailand. Abu Zubaydah had been shot several times during his capture and was now near death. He needed urgent medical care. The only experienced interrogators on site were a Muslim FBI agent and his colleague. They believed they wouldn't need to coerce him. Standard police interrogation methods would get Zubaydah to talk. This is the first time they've described what happened on television. The mindset was death for Zubaydah was not an option. It was at one point that his medical condition took a turn for the worse and he defecated on himself. I just grabbed a towel and began to clean him up. 
uh, only because it just seemed like the right thing to do, the, the, the humane thing to do. He recognized it, and, and, you know, I held his hand and just kept on reassuring that these people are going to take care of you. We're not going to let you die. It was a surreal moment where, you know, we're taking care of the terrorist, but at the same time we're, we're talking to him and trying to get intelligence from him. You know, there's that idea about these terrorists that they don't talk, and I think if you approach them the right way, from my experience, uh, sometimes you have a problem with shutting them up. The FBI's tried and tested approach would pay off. The agent showed him photographs of leading Al-Qaeda suspects. To their amazement, Abu Zubaydah delivered the crown jewels. When Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's photo came up, Zubaydah just grabbed my arm like this to stop me, which just made me just totally have a big take back going, wait a minute, is he playing a game with me? He says, that's Mukhtar. Now that was in a eureka moment for me. Mukhtar's name had been out there in all the chatter, but we didn't know who Mukhtar was. Zubaydah asked us, Steve, he goes, how did you know that Mukhtar was the mastermind of September 11th? Which, exactly, I tried not to do that with my eyes. I needed to convince Zubaydah that we knew exactly everything that he was about to say, that we knew everything about Mukhtar's role in September 11th, which of course we didn't know at the time. So we called a timeout, we excused the room, and my partner basically had to hold me because I thought I was going to fall down. We were like, wow, what just happened here? Really? Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? You know? Mukhtar is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? He did 9-11? My God. I mean, you know, he wasn't even on our radar screen. In Washington, the director of the CIA was excited by the intelligence until he found it was coming from the FBI and his interrogators had still to arrive. A few days later, Special Agent Gordon was given another chance to interview Zubaydah at length. He said, there are two people that I sent to Mukhtar. I knew that was extremely significant. Mukhtar isn't sending them to baking school and he isn't sending them to play football. He's sending them somewhere to cause mass murder. We got to find out who these people are. He didn't give me their names, but he adequately described them. One of them, he said, was an American, and one was uh, uh, someone from the UK. The CIA quickly discovered that two men had just tried to get on a plane in Pakistan and sent the FBI their passport photos. We showed him the photos. He was shocked. He said, yep, that's them. That's the two guys. Zubeda identified the two men as Jose Padilla, an American citizen, and a UK resident, Binyam Mohammed. I looked at him straight in the face and I said, see, I told you from day one, every question I ask you, we most probably know the answer to. According to the FBI, Zubeda claimed that both men were bent on attacking the West. They are going to him saying, hey, Zubeda, hey, we'd like to blow this up, we'd like to do that. Basically, what he says to us is, I don't need these two guys to plan bombings for me. He goes, i got plenty of people that know how to plan bombs and make bombs. I need these guys so they can travel because they have the clean passports to do it. That was beyond goal to him. One of the things they had mentioned to him was, if we get some sort of uranium and we do this and this with it, we can have some sort of a dirty bomb go off in the U.S. America stopped an Al-Qaeda plot to explode a radioactive device. In May 2002, as he landed in Chicago, the American Jose Padilla was arrested. Binya Mohammed, the 24-year-old Ethiopian who'd been living in London for eight years, was arrested in Pakistan as he tried to leave the country. This was just the beginning of a seven-year ordeal across three continents. Binya Mohammed says that in Pakistan he was hung by his wrists, beaten with a leather strap and subjected to a mock execution. He alleges MI5 was aware he was being tortured. His case would raise questions about what the British government knew about his treatment.
General Pervez Musharraf was president of Pakistan throughout most of this time when many terrorist suspects were interrogated. And Musharraf was a crucial ally in the West's war against Al-Qaeda. We are dealing with vicious people. And we have to get information. Now if we are extremely decent, we then don't get any information. We need to allow uh, leeway to the intelligence operatives, the, the people who interrogate. It's American Paymaster. Nowhere is this more evident than in the tribal regions bordering Afghanistan. It's in this distant wilderness that many terrorist operations against the West, including the airlines plot, begin. This is where Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda fled to after 9-11. So why hasn't bin Laden been captured or killed? I used to brief President Bush every Thursday morning. I got that question in some way, shape or form once a week, every Thursday morning. And I, I came back and I hit the button and I called my chief of counterterrorism and said, C come on. Up. I said, for the nth time, the President of the, these United States has asked me, why can't we find Osama bin Laden? And my chief of counterterrorism, very serious man, very talented, leans forward and said, in response to my question, why can't we find him? He says, because he's hiding. But we're going to smoke him out. And we're adjusting our thinking to the new type of enemy. There's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. Why hasn't Osama bin Laden been captured 10 years old? Because the area is hostile and the people being uh, sympathetic, uh, where people have provided him safe haven in the past. He was one of the Mujahideen who came uh, against the Soviets. Uh, so at that time he was a hero, isn't it? He, uh, these Mujahideen were all considered to be heroes fighting the Soviets. And now he's a villain and he has to be apprehended. Uh, the people, uh, their custom is of hospitality uh, towards a guest and they are known to provide hospitality even with their lives. And it was to these tribal areas that Rashid Rauf, one of the suspected instigators of the airline's plot, headed after escaping from under the noses of his Pakistani guards. Now, in relative safety, he was free to help coordinate further plots against the West. In the late summer of 2008, he met a young jihadi volunteer who'd been brought up in America. This was the new, very dangerous model, which is, we, Al-Qaeda, will recruit you, we will train you to be very capable, and he was very capable in terms of the explosives that he was making. Very dangerous, very, very, very um, uh, potent. Um, and then we'll send you home and you figure out what your target's going to be, but just make it big and, and, and impactful. After being trained in Pakistan, new recruit Najibullah Zazi headed back to America. He'd been identified as a terrorist suspect through intercepted emails. The FBI secretly monitored him buying peroxide and acetone, household products that were the ingredients for a bomb. This was the real thing. This wasn't aspirational. This wasn't he was planning to or thinking about. This was he had built the explosives, tested them, understood that he could build them and was going to New York to manufacture more explosives and then to deploy that operation likely in New York. Zazi planned to strike at the very heart of New York, but the FBI had him in their sights. They watched him visit some of the biggest transport intersections like Grand Central Station and suspected he was planning a catastrophic attack on the subway. But before he could act, the police arrested him and two other members of his cell. Were it not for the combined efforts of the law enforcement and intelligence communities, it could have been devastating. 
the FBI's operation disrupted what would have been America's first homegrown suicide attack. Najib Azazi, he represented probably the gravest threat of terrorism on American soil since 9-11. For the second time, a major plot linked to Rashid Rauf had narrowly failed to inflict massive civilian casualties. In November 2008, it appears that Rashid Rauf's career as a key Al-Qaeda operative suddenly came to an end. My information is that Rashid Raouf was killed um, in a drone attack. For several years, the Americans had been developing a new state-of-the-art tactic. It's a high-tech pilotless drone aircraft with a lethal payload of Hellfire missiles. It's used to target key figures in Al-Qaeda bypassing the need for Pakistan's sometimes unreliable cooperation. It's known as the Predator. Obama's election victory in November 2008 signaled a fundamental shift in America's approach to the war against Al-Qaeda. Under previous president George W. Bush, the CIA and the military had been given free reign to wage a secret war against the terrorists using abduction, secret interrogation black sites and torture. America doesn't torture and I'm going to make sure that we don't torture. Those are part and parcel of an effort to regain America's moral stature in the world. Obama pledged to restore human rights to the balance between liberty and security. But behind the liberal rhetoric was a ruthless decision to hit Al-Qaeda hard, using legally questionable means. America first deployed its new secret weapon under George W. Bush, but now Obama decided to ratchet up the use of these pilotless aircraft. My agency has pointed out that a significant fraction of Al-Qaeda senior leadership in the tribal region has the euphemism we have used is taken off the battlefield. By the way, taken off the battlefield used to mean killed or captured. In the last couple of years, taken off the battlefield simply means killed we just aren't doing many, any, capturing. Although launched from Afghanistan, the drones are piloted by remote control thousands of miles away inside the United States. The military is happy to show off its drones, but the CIA program is so secret, the agency won't even acknowledge its existence that a significant portion of Al-Qaeda senior le leadership in the tribal region of Pakistan has been killed. By drones? Well, your words, not mine. All I can say is they've been killed. Killed with suddenness and precision, I couldn't. President Obama has authorized more than 160 drone strikes, almost four times those sanctioned by President Bush. The best game in town, uh, the one that's the one that's shifted uh, the battlefield in our favor. It has been a very strong, significant force in making Al Qaeda senior leadership spend most of their waking moments worrying about their survival rather than threatening yours or mine, and that is a war-winning effort. But there's a downside to drone attacks. Hundreds of civilians have been killed. <laughs> 
protests have mounted across Pakistan, fueling anti-American propaganda even more. What's your view of the drone attacks on Pakistani soil? I'm sure that they pick up the right targets. But then there is the problem of collateral damage, number one, killing of civilians. And the second issue of violation of our territorial integrity or sovereignty. Did you say the Americans could do this? Did you say they could carry out drone attacks on Pakistani no. soil? No, I didn't say that. You didn't agree to it? No, no. The use of drone strikes inside countries where the US is not involved in armed conflict is a violation of international law, according to some authorities. And some believe it's tantamount to unlawful extrajudicial killing. This is a, a quite awesome power, the power to, to label somebody as an enemy and by virtue of having labeled them as an enemy, uh, wipe them out without judicial process of any kind. Isn't that state authorized assassination? To target suspects, fire missiles at them from out of the sky? Absolutely not. In the traditional conduct of war, and, and Peter, that's, that's the punchline here. This is a war. You ask the question, aren't these assassinations? No, they're not assassinations. Okay? This is armed conflict. This is action against opposing armed enemy force. This is an inherent right of the American state to self-defense. But the war is in Afghanistan, not in Pakistan. Ah, that may be some people's views, but it is not the view of the United States government. The president, two presidents of the United States have said we're at war. We've seen over and over again the administration, at first the Bush administration and now the Obama administration, label somebody as a terrorist only to find out later on that the evidence we relied on was, was weak or, or, or just outright wrong. The first question is have they identified the person right? The second question is have they targeted it? You know, have they got the right place to shoot the drone at? Is that where the individual really is? The odds of them getting that right are very slim. And then the third problem is who does get killed? Are these really Taliban people and Al-Qaeda or are they random civilians who had nothing to do with it? I think we'd be naive to believe the, the propaganda that says that firing these fantastic weapons is killing the right people. Although President Obama may be free of the stigma of abduction and torture, drone attacks are now fueling Al-Qaeda propaganda, just as the abuses under the Bush administration once did. And they're driving more recruits to the terrorist cause, as one dramatic event in late 2009 was to prove. Forward operating base Chapman is the intelligence nerve center of America's secret drone war. Located in Khost, just across the Afghan border from Pakistan, it's where the CIA gather pinpoint intelligence to target the drones. The drones only work if you have good human intelligence sources on the ground that tell you where to fly. From here, the CIA runs a network of spies and informers. This is the precarious front line in the secret war on terror. If you're going to run assets into the tribal belt on the Pakistani side of the Afghan-Pakistan border, you have to be as close as possible. You don't want to have to communicate with them from afar. You want to be able to deal with your assets within an hour or so after they leave Pakistan. This is very dangerous work against a very capable enemy. Uh, that's an example of our pursuing the kind of exquisite intelligence that is legally and morally required before you can carry on some of these activities. This is not without risk. Towards the end of 2009, the CIA agents at the base were presented with a unique opportunity. Jordanian intelligence had a Palestinian source called Khalid al-Balawi, 
who said he'd infiltrated the highest ranks of Al-Qaeda. In this case, you had an asset who had spent considerable time building his cover story, that he was a penetration of Al-Qaeda, that he had been an Al-Qaeda propagandist, but that he had turned. He had come to see that Al-Qaeda was an enemy of Islam. What al-Balawi was offering was the holy grail of the secret intelligence war. Al-Balawi was offering extraordinary information, something we'd been looking for for a decade and hadn't even come close to. The location of high-value target number two and perhaps high-value target number one. I'm on Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden. Second only to the elusive Osama bin Laden, al-Zawahiri was the strategic mastermind of al-Qaeda. Al-Balawi's story seemed highly credible, an opportunity that could not be missed, and he came with eye-watering proof of his association with Zawahiri. My understanding is that he actually provided photographs that showed him and Zawahiri meeting together. The ultimate proof that he knew where the target was. The CIA agents arranged to meet their priceless asset at the base. When al-Balawi arrived with his Jordanian handler, the most valuable asset the agency had ever recruited in its secret war against al-Qaeda was greeted by a CIA reception committee. But only hours before he entered the CIA compound, al-Balawi had recorded this chilling video message for his hosts. Don't think that you just press the button, killing Mujahideen, you are safe. Inshallah, will death to, will come to you through unexpected way, Inshallah. Look, this is for you. It's not watch. It's detonator. To kill as much as I can, Inshallah. This inshallah. is my dua. To kill you to kill your uh, partner, Jordanian partner, and inshallah, I go to the Firdaus al paradise, and you will be sent to the hell. And yom al-qiyamah, we will inshallah see you again. Allah. As al-Balawi stepped down from the car, the CIA moved in to check him out. They were concerned that his hands were still under his cloak. Al-Balawi pressed the button. Seven CIA officers were killed, including the head of station. It was the deadliest attack on the CIA in more than 25 years. The attack at Khost showed just how sophisticated and cunning Al-Qaeda has become. It's not watch. It's a detonator to kill as much as I can, inshallah. In this deadliest of spy games, Al-Qaeda had outwitted the CIA and won. And inshallah, I go to the Firdaus al paradise and you will be sent to the hell. You had here an operation where Al-Qaeda is running it and using two allies in order to facilitate the operation. A triple agent, three organizations involved in running it, a prior suicide video already made. This was a very elaborate, very thought through operation. The Jordanian and the American intelligence services offered me millions of dollars to work with them and spy on Mujahideen here. But Alhamdulillah, I came to the Mujahideen and I told them everything. Sitting next to Al Balawi in the suicide video, was the brother of the Taliban leader in Pakistan who'd been killed in a drone attack six months earlier. Abu Dujana al Khurasani, may Allah have mercy on him, who told the American CIA and Jordanian intelligence a lesson they will never forget with Allah's permission. The attack on the CIA base was clinical revenge. America's drone war has had other far-reaching consequences. The terror from the skies has disrupted the leadership of Al-Qaeda in Pakistan 
and diminished its ability to train and organize there. That's a key reason why, since 2009, Al-Qaeda's focus has changed. It's always been a learning organization. I mean, it's always adapted. It's, it's uh, for want of a better phrase, a worthy adversary in, 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 in that sense. Uh, but I think as a measure of our success, Al-Qaeda has been forced to adapt, perhaps in ways that they would not have chosen otherwise. It's suffered lots of setbacks. It's lost some key people. But like all um, terrorist organizations, it mutates and learns. The franchise is spread out. So there will be groups all around the world, some of whom may be directed today by the call of Al-Qaeda. You know, it looks as though the only place we, we don't think it is is Antarctica. The Christmas Day attack on the flight over Detroit was a terrifying demonstration of Al-Qaeda's new flexibility. The young bomber, Umar Farooq Abdul Muttalab, had never set foot in Pakistan. The Nigerian student had been trained in Yemen by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or AQAP. In my opinion, AQAP right now uh, is a greater imminent threat than core Al-Qaeda. Yemen has now become an alternative location for terrorist training, a location that boasts its own charismatic Al-Qaeda figurehead. It is important that we present the proper role models for ourselves to follow for our children. For Anwar al-Awlaki is an American citizen and has become notorious as the Bin Laden of the Internet. He's been linked to nearly every recent terrorist attack in the West. Therefore, we need to study their biographies, learn about them. After the abortive aircraft and attack on Christmas Day, al-Awlaki squeezed every ounce of propaganda out of it. Our brother Omar Farouk has succeeded in breaking through the security systems that have cost the U.S. government alone over $40 billion since 9-11. So Al-Alaki is more than just a cleric? Much more than just a cleric. What is he? He's a terrorist. And he's involved increasingly in virtually every plot we see emanating from the Arabian Peninsula because of the power of his ideological message. Because of the global reach of the Internet and the fact that he speaks English, Al-Awlaki has managed to radicalize and recruit young Muslims around the world, seduced by his call to jihad. He's becoming the spokesman for an Islamist revolution. We cannot stand idly in the face of such aggression, and we will fight back and incite others to do the same. It's a terrible tragedy. It's stunning. Uh, and uh, as I say, as I've gone around to the hospital here, uh, as I've been at the scene, uh, soldiers uh, and family members and many of the great civilians that work here are absolutely devastated. Al-Awlaki was mentor to Major Nidal Hassan, a Palestinian psychiatrist serving in the American military. In November 2009, he shot dead 13 soldiers inside a Texas military base. In May last year, a young British student stabbed and wounded the former government minister Stephen Timms at his constituency surgery. She admitted she'd drawn the inspiration to kill him from watching Al Awlaki on the internet. A very charismatic individual. He's very articulate. Uh, and if we could say in, in some shape, an intelligent human being, uh, albeit warped human being. Last October, Al Awlaki's group managed to place two sophisticated bombs on cargo planes bound for the US. They were concealed in printer cartridges. Had the bombs exploded, the results could have been two Lockerbie style disasters. It was not only sophisticated, but it was creative and incredibly, incredibly difficult to detect through routine measures that are taken. And Al-Awlaki lost no opportunity to publicize his coup. 
His glossy in-house magazine boasted the operation had cost just $4,200, including post and packing. It had forced every cargo company to increase its security at great cost. al awlaki's revolutionary influence is being felt inside Muslim communities across the English-speaking world. In the UK, a mosque in Luton has experienced the effect. In Anwar al awlaki you know, without a doubt, we can't deny he is, um, his, his knowledge is disseminated. People listen to him. What's his appeal? His appeal is to, is, is he goes against the grain. You know, here's America and here's the West the great satans attacking the Muslim lands, we have to defend ourselves. Um, so people tend to appear, to, to, to tend to like this sort of um, uh, person because he's, go, he's going against the grain. During Ramadan in 2007, a young man came to the Luton Islamic Center and began expressing extremist views and preaching the need for jihad. The mosque chairman stepped in. I exposed his beliefs in front of all the community and he was sitting there listening to all that. And I thought that would be enough embarrassment for him to remain silent, but instead he got up and he stormed out. Then, last December, a suicide bomber attacked the center of Stockholm. The bomber blew himself up, but luckily no one else died as his bomb exploded before he could reach the busy shopping streets. The bomber's name was Taimur al-Abdali. He was the young Muslim who'd stormed out of the Luton Mosque. It's thought that Anwar al-Awlaki influenced al-Abdali in Stockholm. Would that surprise you? No, no, it wouldn't surprise me because Anwar al-Awlaki advocates suicide bombing. He advocates killing innocent people. Al-Awlaki's influence and ability to communicate directly with so many impressionable young Muslims suggests that it's more important than ever for the community to inform the police about potential extremists. But for many Muslims, that's a difficult and controversial step to take. Didn't you feel any obligation as a British citizen to inform the authorities about somebody about whom you're concerned because of the extremist views? If we are seen to pass on information about the people that we're dealing with on a grassroots level, number one, we lose our credibility. Number two, these people will then go into hiding. That makes the job for the intelligence service more harder. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَىٰ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْقَرْآنِ Al-Awlaki is now a marked man. It's believed that he's become the first American citizen to be designated for capture or killing by the CIA, authorized by President Obama. I understand that the President has authorized the targeting of Al-Awlaki is that not state authorized assassination? You know I can't comment on that, Peter. But he's somebody you would be happy to see removed from the scene. What I would be happy is that these individuals need to be neutralized in some way. Al Awlaki personifies the most pressing current threat in the secret war on terror. His ability to preach in English through the internet has radicalized a new generation. But many in the intelligence world I've spoken to now point to another looming danger rooted in the spread of militant Islam around the world. To find out more, I travel to the cold and unlikely setting of America's Midwest. Minneapolis is home to the largest community of Somalis in the United States. Most have fled the brutal civil wars that have ravaged their homeland for more than 30 years. Zuhur Ahmed hosts a local community radio show. Here with the Somali community because they're newly immigrant communities and they have yet to adapt to the American system. 
Um, there's a lot of uh, broken families. There's a lot of issues here and struggles as far as um, youth and uh, the older generation. There's a gap between um, parents and their children. So because of all of these existing issues, of course, there were, you know, it created that vulnerable group of young men. We're just coming into the Somali area now, are we? Yeah, that's correct. This is the uh, Cedar Riverside area of uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. FBI agent E.K. Wilson became concerned three years ago when a number of young Somalis suddenly disappeared from their homes. They had, in some cases, left for school one morning and simply uh, not returned, simply vanished. And, and the parents uh, would have no idea where they had gone, what they were doing? Correct, right. Um, but even, you know, given that dramatic set of circumstances, there was still no, nobody coming to the police or nobody coming to the FBI saying, was my, my son, son disappeared, was he kidnapped, uh, we're concerned for safety. We know that, that uh, young men had disappeared, that they had left uh, their families here in Minneapolis um, without saying where they were going. Um, they had um, made their way back to Somalia. At least 20 young Somalis had left Minneapolis and traveled 8,000 miles to the heart of a brutal civil war. They'd gone to fight for Al-Shabaab, which means the youth, a militant Islamic army fighting for control of the country. Al-Shabaab is affiliated to Al-Qaeda. When you look at the Al-Shabaab videos, they're calling out for the youth, specifically for the youth, and they're saying, come on, fight for your land, come on, fight for your religion, and come on, um, you know, free yourself from the oppression. One of the young men who went to join Al-Shabaab was Shoa Ahmed. To his friends, he was just a typical American kid who'd recently left college. Nimko Ahmed had been his good friend for many years since their days together at high school. He did well, everything he did. You know, things that every young uh, man do in this country, work, go to school, go to the movies, play basketball. Um, and just hang out, and that was sure. But someone who was never violent, someone who never raised their voice at anyone, someone who just respected everybody and were very like those that know him. But in 2008, Shoa Ahmed drove a vehicle loaded with explosives into a Somali government compound and blew himself up, killing 29 people never came to mind that I would actually know someone who actually commit a suicide bombing because that was something that I normally would just see and always be frightened about. But the first day I actually saw Shira's face, it was on a newspaper. And, and I just broke down. I, I broke down and I just didn't know whether it was Sam Shira I knew or this was somebody else. He was America's first ever suicide bomber. His remains were returned to his family in Minneapolis. They're now buried beneath the snow. Although so far Al-Shabaab has never been linked to attacks on the West, the FBI is concerned about other young Somalis returning to the US not to be buried, but to send fellow Americans to their graves. But our number one priority has to be the fact that one of these individuals could potentially come back to the United States and carry out an attack. Most people in the Somali community find this difficult to believe. Because I know these young men, um, I, I don't see them do that, doing that. Knowing that their families are here in this country and they would not never want to actually jeopardize their families' lives. But at FBI headquarters in Washington, the feeling is very different. 
Are you worried about young American Muslims going to Somalia, joining Al Shabaab, and then coming back and forming sleeper cells on mainland America? Yes, and they may have already done that, and that is one of our missions, is to detect that and to prevent that. But we would be not doing our job if we weren't thinking ahead and looking at the possibility that actually some of these folks are coming back for planning here in the United States and attacks. And why do you say some of them may already have done that? We have not identified all of those individuals and they've traveled back to the United States. So the question is, has that evolution of the group and their contacts with other Al-Qaeda affiliates matured to the point where the United States is the primary goal? More than 250,000 Somalis live in the UK. They're one of the most marginalized communities in the country. And British intelligence believes that a significant number of their young men have gone back to Somalia to train and fight with Al-Shabaab. Have you concerns about young British Somalis traveling to Somalia? I think we have to be concerned about some of these journeys, which clear, some of them clearly have no innocent explanation. We know there are terrorist training camps uh, in Somalia. Uh, and there is real worry that uh, some of these young people have been drawn there uh, to train uh, and that there has to be the possibility that some of them will return to the UK uh, with the intention of uh, committing some sort of terrorist activity here. Ten years on from the 9-11 attacks, the secret war on terror has changed beyond recognition. Al-Qaeda is now global, resilient, adaptable and inventive. The American base at Guantanamo Bay is a stubborn reminder of how difficult and controversial the war has been. Within days of taking office, President Obama promised to close Guantanamo and with it an unedifying chapter in American history. And we then provide the process whereby Guantanamo will be closed uh, no later than one year from now. But more than two years later, there are still around 170 detainees held without trial, many Al-Qaeda's hardcore. Some have been ill-treated in the past. We were only allowed to film a few and forbidden to show their faces. Well, <laughs> We've been with these guys for nine years. We we know who, you know, we know who we picked off the battlefield. We know what type of guys they are as far as compliant and non-compliant. Um, just because they are compliant doesn't mean that their ideology has not changed. They still want to kill our guards. They still um, want to disrupt uh, our organization. Um, they're still in a fight. The continuing existence of Guantanamo provides Al-Qaeda with an ongoing propaganda gift. But the military believes it's still serving its purpose. Has Guantanamo made America safer? Though the individuals are here, uh, here in Guantanamo, uh, they're off the battlefield. So, and therefore, that, is, uh, that has helped, that has contributed to uh, you know, making us safer, I would think. Yes. Half the remaining detainees have been cleared for release, but many of the countries they come from don't want to take them back, believing they're too dangerous. President Obama pledged to try detainees in civilian courts in America, but it's proved almost impossible. Much of the evidence obtained through torture and ill-treatment is likely to be thrown out. So now the president has ordered a resumption of military tribunals at Guantanamo Bay. For the time being, it looks like he's stuck with Guantanamo and the legacy it represents. If you remember September the 12th, 2001, there was an enormous reservoir of goodwill towards the United States because Americans had been victims of a terrible crime. But because we responded to that in a way that threw away our values, 
Uh, we, and we were viewed as hypocrites. We created Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, and we said it was to pervert, preserve our way of life, and yet the first thing we jettisoned was the rule of law. Hypocrisy breeds hatred, and I'm afraid it has bred hatred around the world. And now people, large numbers of people around the world, despise us who used to feel sympathy for us. But despite the damage done to America's reputation by the abuses of the secret war, some intelligence chiefs feel that the pressure on Al-Qaeda is paying off. They believe that 10 years of steady attrition against Al-Qaeda has made a 9-11 type attack much less likely. It's much more difficult for them to conduct the spectacular. The way I summarize it is, uh, future attacks will be less complex, less well organized, less likely to succeed, less lethal if they do succeed, and more numerous. I mean, what is Al-Qaeda other than a terrorist organization? I mean, what, what's, what's the identity of Al-Qaeda globally? If you take terror away, they're pretty damn ordinary. The secret war has left its lasting mark on the conflict, but there's now a growing realization within the intelligence community that hearts and minds are an increasingly critical front on the battleground. I think that making sure that we hold to our values, our ethical standards, our laws, and are not tempted to go down the route which others, in my view, have made the profound mistake of going down, means that in the longer run, we'll have a chance from that moral authority of addressing some of the underlying causes of these problems, looking for the long-term, the long-term political solutions. Is the war winnable? Not in a military sense. There won't be a Waterloo and, uh, um, and El Alamein. If we can get to a state where there are fewer attacks, less lethal attacks, fewer young people being drawn into this, less causes, resolution of the Palestinian question, uh, less impetus for this activity, I think we can get to a stage where the threat is most reduced. But the terminology about winning the war on terror was not something that I ever subscribed to. Operations against the organization were a finger in the dike. We can't fight the revolutionary message. For a message to die takes a long time, takes decades or multiple decades. If it were only a question of eliminating a few hundred people, I'd say that's a much easier question to answer. But it's not. It's elimination of a revolution. In the end, most terrorist conflicts are either resolved by outright victory for one side or the other, or by governments talking to the terrorists and addressing the political roots of the conflict. A dramatic new way of thinking may now be required. Do we have to talk to Al-Qaeda? I would hope that people are trying to do so. I don't know. It's always better to talk to the people who um, are attacking you than, than attacking them, if you can. I don't know whether they are but I would hope that people are trying to reach out to the Taliban, to people on the edges of Al-Qaeda, to talk to them. Do you think that the terrorists, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, will listen? I don't know. Doesn't mean to say it's not worth trying.